This is going to be Genesis chapter 15. And I want to talk about walking by faith. The first thing is faith cometh by hearing. In Romans ten seventeen it says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So the more you hear the word of God, the more faith will be produced in you. Abram could walk by faith because he would hear the word. He had his ears open to the word. He was ready to receive the word. It says in Genesis 15, 1, And after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. So God spoke to men in a vision or dream before a written word was complete. You see, we got the written word today. So I don't need God to come to me at night in a dream or a vision and tell me what's going to happen 10 years from now. Like, you see all these people on YouTube saying, well, God came to me in a dream or I had a vision and the rapture is going to happen on 2027 or something like that. You see, God doesn't operate that way. We've got a written word. In Numbers 12 and verse 6, it shows you that back then the Lord would talk to them in a vision or a dream. It says, and he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. But see, today he speaks to us in his word. Peter says we have a more sure word of prophecy. In Isaiah 1, 1, it says the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos. So he spoke to Isaiah in a vision. He spoke to Abram in a vision. Men would even claim to hear the word of the Lord in a vision when they actually didn't hear him. And they do the same thing today. That's what I was talking to you about. You got these men coming around saying, I had this vision. I had this dream. In Jeremiah fourteen fourteen, it says, Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision and divination, and a thing of naught, and the deceit of their heart. Today, we have a complete written word. We can have faith in a perfect book. We can filter what men say through the Bible, because the word of God is pure and trustworthy. Psalm 12, 6 and 7 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. When a false dreamer shows up on YouTube or on the TBN network, I can filter everything he says through the Bible. And I'll know if he's a fake or a fraud or a money-hungry satanic puppet because what he's saying doesn't line up with the book, or he's trying to give me some extra biblical revelation that's not in the book. But the word came to Abram in a vision. The word of the Lord comes to me in words on paper. I have 66 books from God himself, and I can open the Bible, and it is as personal to me as if God wrote my name on it and my address on it, and they're as personal to me as if he put them in my own personal mailbox outside my house. Did you know the more you read the Bible, the more you'll believe it? Just like the news media repeats lies to you over and over so that you will begin to believe it. The same goes for the truth. What are you putting in your mind over and over? What the news media says or what the Bible says? The news media and Hollywood, the music industry and education has brainwashed you in wickedness, now you need to open the Bible and be brainwashed in truth and holiness, and you will get your faith back. Faith cometh by hearing. I can walk by faith because I'm staying in the book. I'm in the book. Next, I can walk by faith because, not only because the because faith cometh by hearing, but because the Father is almighty. In Mark 10, 27, And Jesus looking upon them saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. I can walk by faith because my faith is in a God who can do everything. In Job 42, 1 and 2, it says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything. In Genesis 15, 1, it says, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. When you have a God like ours, then you know anything is possible because he is the Almighty. He is our shield. He said to Abram, I am thy shield. 
The Lord is better than any defense the military has. If the military of every nation got together to fight an intergalactic battle, they couldn't come up with a defense better than my shield. And it's very clear. He is my shield. In Second Samuel 22, 3, The God of my rock in him will I trust he is my shield. Psalm 3, 3, But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. Psalm 5.12, For thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous with favor, wilt thou compass him as with a shield. Psalm 28.7, The Lord is my strength and my shield. Psalm 59.11, Slay them not, lest my people forget, scatter them by thy power, and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. Psalm 84.11, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. Deuteronomy 33, 29. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people, saved by the Lord, the shield of thy help, and who is the sword of thine excellency. Ephesians six sixteen. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The thing the Lord is promising to Abram seems far-fetched, but with our shield, with God that's the Father, who's almighty, Nothing is impossible. The salvation that God promised us seems far-fetched to this world, but nothing is impossible with God who is our shield. We can walk by faith because he's rocking in front of us. He's our shield. Someone asked me, how can the blood of a man who died 2,000 years ago save me from my sin in 2021? Because with God, nothing is impossible. That is the God I walk by faith in. It wasn't just a man with man's blood that died on the cross for me. It is God with God's blood who died on the cross. Acts twenty twenty eight says he purchased us with his own blood. Who did? God did. Abram asked God a sincere question. Abram had been promised that God was going to give him a seed. In Genesis thirteen sixteen. it says, And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth... Then shall thy seed also be numbered. This seems far-fetched, because Abraham and his wife were so old. Abram was in his 80s at this point, and he knew it would be an unbelievable thing for him to have a child at this point. So he says to the Lord, in verse 2, And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? You just said, you're my reward. What will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. You see, Abram is very practical. He doesn't act like some great big giant of the faith. He says, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? He doesn't just automatically say, bless God, amen, I believe everything you're saying, without asking a question. He has a sincere question. And verse 3 says, And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my, ha mine house, my house is mine heir. Abram basically says, Lord, you haven't given me a seed yet. You promised me back there in chapter 13 you're going to give me a seed that's... More than the dust of the earth, how am I going to have an heir? How am I going to have this seed? By the servant born in my house? By this Eliezer of Damascus, my steward? Is that how I'm going to get it? But the Lord says no. Basically just says no. In verse 4, he says, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. So it won't be Eliezer. Eliezer didn't come out of his own bowels, but the Lord, but the heir will come forth out of Abram's own bowels. The bowels are the insides in the Bible. It's going to be a son straight from Abram. Genesis fifteen five, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. So to this world, this is impossible for an old man to have a, a child. Somebody that's old as Abraham and his wife. To God, it isn't impossible. To the world, it is impossible for that many people to come from Abraham. So many people that they would outnumber the stars. But with God, it isn't impossible. I believe this is completely literal. God tells Abram to tell the stars. This doesn't mean for Abram to go tell something to the stars. Tell means to count, like a bank teller. The Lord says to Abram, Tell the stars, if they'll be able to number them, so shall thy seed be. So God is telling Abram that the same way you can't count the stars, that is the same way your seed's going to be, innumerable. And this is because in eternity, there will be men who won't be in glorified bodies like me and you. You see, we get glorified bodies at the rapture, and you know we'll neither marry nor be given in marriage. 
But there's going to be people who are still in natural bodies. And they will continue to have children. And the Lord's kingdom just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That's why in Isaiah 9, 7, it says, Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Look at Abram's faith. In Genesis 15, 6 through 8, it says, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. What did he believe? He believed that God was going to do what he said. He was going to have a seed that would be innumerable as the stars and as the dust of the earth. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, where shall, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Abram wants assurance, just like any of us want assurance. The same way you wanted assurance about your salvation. You see, Abram isn't better than you. He's just like you. And that's why John wrote his epistle. And he gave us assurance when he said, These things have I written unto you in 1 John five thirteen. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. So with the Father who is almighty, we can boldly walk by faith like Abraham. Next, if you're going to walk by faith, then you need to focus on heavenly things. In Colossians 3, 2, it says, Set your affection on things above. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. And look what Abraham did in Genesis 15, 5 through 6. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven. Abraham is looking toward heaven. You need to stay looking toward heaven. Just like you did the moment you got saved. When you got saved, you were being eternally minded because you had your mind on what you were going to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you had your mind on where your soul was going to spend eternity. Abraham looked up and believed that the Lord was going to make his seed as the stars of heaven. He believed the unbelievable. And that's why so many times in the New Testament, Abraham... His salvation is compared to ours. In Romans 4, 2, and 3, it says, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Abraham believed God about his seed, and the Lord imputed righteousness to him because of that. Abram's faith is a picture of our faith. It goes on to talk about him in Romans four eighteen through 25. It says, Who against hope believed in hope. You see, there was no hope that Abraham could have a baby with Sarah in his old age. But against hope, he believed in hope. He believed anyway that he might become the father of many nations. Who would have thought Abraham and his wife in their old age could become the father of many nations? According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, even though he was old. When he was about a hundred years old... Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, even though she was old. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform, because the Father is almighty. Nothing is impossible with God. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Abram was counted righteous before he was circumcised and before he almost offered Isaac on the altar. He pictures our salvation, which is by grace through faith, without works. He's a great picture of our salvation today. And it talks about him again in the book of Galatians. Galatians 3, 6 through 8. And even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know you therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. If you're going to walk by faith then focus on heavenly things. Focus on your great salvation and what is coming because you believed in the Lord. A new body, no pain, no sorrow, no crying. New Jerusalem, crowns, and the sinless walk and fellowship with the Lord. We can walk by faith because we focus on heavenly things. And next, because the finished work of Christ is in the New Testament. You see, we got something that Abraham did not have. All the time we think, well, these Old Testament saints are just so greater and are so much better than us, but we have something that he didn't have. 
In Genesis 15, 9 and 10, it, it says, And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid them each piece one against another. But the birds he divided not. We have something better than what Abraham had. We have the finished blood atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to do bloody animal sacrifices for any reason. Abraham had to do these bloody animal sacrifices. And Hebrews 10.4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Me and you have the blood of Jesus Christ on our soul. Abraham didn't have that. Abraham, you see, even though Abraham's salvation is a picture of ours, it wasn't completely like ours. There's some things we got at salvation that Abraham did not get. Abraham was not born again. This wasn't possible until the Comforter would come after the Lord's resurrection. Abraham wasn't spiritually circumcised like we are. He would simply be physically circumcised. Abraham wasn't part of the body of Christ because nobody was in the body before the cross until, you know, like Ephesians 2.16 reveals to us. Abraham didn't have the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ applied to him like we do. If he did, then why was he, why do you see him on more than one occasion offering bloody animal sacrifices? If the Lord was already applying the blood of Jesus to these Old Testament saints, then why were they doing these bloody animal sacrifices? And why was the Lord applying the blood of Jesus before the blood of Jesus had even been shed? Abraham was the friend of God, but me and you are the sons of God. You know, our relationship with the Lord is even better than Abraham's. And look at how great his relationship with the Lord is. You are a son of God. You can accomplish things just like Abraham did. You just got to walk by faith. We can walk by faith even better than Abraham because he didn't have half of what we have. You see, when someone teaches that Abraham's salvation is exactly like ours... They lose this great truth. They lose the great truth that we have something better than what Abraham had. And that should cause you to walk by faith even more. Just like Jesus said that the least in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist. Implying that, John, that we're all greater than John the Baptist because we're in the kingdom of God. You see, just like we're greater than Abraham was. Because we entered the kingdom of God through the new birth. So you don't want to make it all the same because you'll, you'll ruin that great truth. Next, when you're walking by faith, the fowls want to stop you. They want to put a big stop sign in front of you. In Genesis 15, 11, it says, And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses that Abraham was, you know, the carcasses Abraham was sacrificing, Abram drove them away. And why is this detail in there? I believe because those fowls picture unclean spirits. Spirits And Abram had to drive them away. David had to play the right kind of music for Saul to get rid of his unclean spirits in 1 Samuel. You see, the unclean spirits want to stop you from walking by faith. And they will cast doubt on the words of God. They want to steal it out of your heart. In Matthew 13, 4, it says, And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. And then in verse 19, it says, And when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. You see, the fowls picture unclean spirits. The unclean spirits know the right word, the right way, and the right God, and their job is to get you to go in the wrong direction. And if they didn't know the right way, then how could they lead you the wrong way so efficiently? James 2.19 says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. You see, they believe the King James Bible. They believe in God, but they hate them both. Drive away the fowls, and you can walk by faith. How do you drive them away? Well, soak yourself in the Word. Listen to the right kind of music. Watch out what you're putting in your eyes. And be careful what you... Let hang around in your heart. Don't let things fester around in your heart. We can walk by faith because we can drive those fowls away. And next, we can walk by faith because we know the full cup will be poured out on the enemies. 
In Genesis 15, 11 through 12, it says, And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, an horror of great darkness fell upon him. When God was making this covenant with Abram, it shows he was in a deep sleep. Abram didn't have anything to do with what you're about to read. He was asleep. It's an unconditional covenant with Abram. In Genesis 15, 13, And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety, surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. This is referring to Abram's seed being a stranger in Egypt, and being afflicted and serving them four hundred years. In Genesis 15, 14, And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. You see, the Lord will let you be afflicted by wicked men, but afterwards he will judge them for afflicting you. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, it says, Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. He'll let them trouble you, and then he'll recompense tribulation back to them just because they troubled you. In Genesis 15, 15, And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Abram would go to his fathers in peace when he died. This shows life after death. Abram would go down to the heart of the earth because the blood of Jesus wouldn't have been shed yet at that point, which is what would eventually allow him access into the third heaven after Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried and resurrected. He, when he resurrected, he took the Old Testament saints up to heaven with him. And Luke 16 shows you that Abraham was in the heart of the earth and could see the rich man on the other side of that great gulf that was fixed as the rich man begged for a drop of water on his tongue. Abraham would go to his fathers in peace after death, but his body would be buried in a good old age. That shows you the soul goes on after death, and your body goes to the grave. His body lasted 175 years, and this is a lot younger than Noah, but still it's considered a good old age by the Lord. And it says in verse 14 in Genesis 15, And also that nation which would be Egypt, whom they shall serve, while I judge. And afterwards shall they come out with great substance. You know, they, uh, they would be judged. God would bring the plagues on Egypt and on Pharaoh. And Israel would exit Egypt with great substance. As it says in Exodus twelve thirty five and 36, And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses. And they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. So they left with great substance. And then it says in Genesis fifteen sixteen, But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now that's that cup I was talking about. The full cup will be poured out on your enemies. You see, they wouldn't completely get the land until the Amorites completely filled their cup. The Lord would give the Amorites a chance to repent. You see, a person, a group of people, or nation has a cup. And the more they sin, the more the cup fills up with the wrath of God. And when they reach a certain point, the Lord will pour the cup out on them. The Amorites hadn't filled their cup up yet at that point. And when Jesus was on the cross, he took the cup of God's wrath for all the sin of mankind. This is why the Lord said, let this cup pass from me. He knew that cup being poured on him would break the fellowship between him and the Father. And that's why he says this in Matthew twenty six thirty nine through 42. It says, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time, and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. So the cup of the wrath of God against all the sin of mankind, would be poured out on the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on the cross. So the Lord has a cup. In Psalm eleven six, it says, Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and in horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. Psalm 75, 8, For in the, in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, and the wine is red, it is full of mixture, and he poureth it out of the same. But the dregs thereof... And all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. 
Isaiah 51, 17 through 22. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. Thus saith thy Lord, the Lord and thy God that pleadeth the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt drink it again. Thou shalt drink it. Thou shalt no more drink it again. Jeremiah twenty five fifteen. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. Matthew twenty twenty two. But Jesus answered and said, Ye you know that you know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of, and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. Revelation 14.10, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. Revelation 16.19, And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine, of the fierceness of his wrath. Revelation 18, 6, Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. Even though our enemies may be prospering around us, and we're persecuted, tried, and afflicted, we can walk by faith because we know we don't have to drink of the cup of the wrath of God, because Jesus took the cup of the wrath of God for us. We are saved from wrath through him. He delivered us from the wrath to come because he took the wrath. It is our enemies who will take the cup because they refuse Jesus Christ's payment. Jesus took the cup so we wouldn't have to. And if they refuse Jesus Christ as their substitute, then they end up having to drink the cup of the fierceness of God's wrath, which is an eternity in the lake of fire. Jesus is the king's cup bearer. The same way Nehemiah had to drink out of the cup to make sure there wasn't no poison before the king would drink it, that is the same way Jesus is the king's cupbearer. He drank the cup. He took the cup of God's wrath. If you're walking by faith, then realize the full cup will be poured out on your enemies. And next, realize you will face affliction in this life. This world hates you and will cause you problems just like Abram's seed had to go into Egypt atop of the world and be afflicted. In 1 John 3, 13, it says, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Don't think it's a strange thing. Don't be surprised because the world hates you. In John fifteen eighteen, it says, If the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. That's what Jesus said. In John 7, 7, The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth. Because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. The world hates Jesus. The world hates you because they don't know Jesus. Just like when Israel went into Egypt, and they had been there for a while, it says in Exodus 1.8, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. Joseph is a type of Jesus, and Pharaoh didn't know, Jesus, didn't know Joseph, just like this world doesn't know Jesus. And that's why the world hates you. They don't know Jesus, just like Pharaoh didn't know Joseph. So, since Pharaoh didn't know Joseph, Joseph was friends with the other Pharaoh, and that's why uh, the other Pharaoh blessed Joseph and his family. Now there was a new king, which knew not Joseph. And today, this world knows not Jesus. Genesis fifteen twelve through 14, And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, and horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety, that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs in Egypt, and shall serve them, the Egyptians and Pharaoh, and they shall afflict them four hundred years, and also that nation, which would be Egypt, whom they shall serve, will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. So the Lord showed Abram in this in a nightmarish dream that his seed would be afflicted, but they would end up being judged for causing trouble to the people of God. This world will be judged for causing you trouble, and there's coming a day when you will leave heaven with the Lord and come down to judge this world on, on white horses and with fire. Genesis fifteen fifteen through 17, And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, thou shalt be buried in a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoke, smoking furnace and a burning lamp, 
that pass between those pieces. That smoking furnace represents Egypt. It says in 1 Kings 8.51, For they be thy people and thine inheritance, which thou broughtest forth out of Egypt from the midst of the furnace of iron. And the burning lamp represents the word of God. In Psalm 119.105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Two things that will help you walk by faith is going through a furnace of affliction like Israel did. And another thing is staying in the word of God to help you through that furnace of affliction. Those two things together will make you a warrior. They will make you walk by faith. Tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope maketh not ashamed. Then Genesis fifteen eighteen through 21, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Kadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephaims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. This is God's covenant land grant with Abraham. It was an unconditional covenant. This covenant with Abraham is different, is a different covenant than what the Lord has with us today. Our faith is like his. He got righteousness by grace through faith without works. We also got righteousness by grace through faith without works. But the covenant land grant goes to Abraham and his physical seed. It's a, it was an unconditional covenant. God's not done with Israel. 